There's also a heater. I do have a, sorry, I do have a, uh, like a steam heater that like makes some noise. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. All right, people, all right. Inna alhamdulillahi wa kafah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-mustafa wa ala ibadihi al-ladhi nartada wa man bihudahu mihtada wa bi athari ahl al-madina tiqtafa wa ba'ad fa salamu allahi ala al-qawm ahlum wa sahlum bikum people Firstly, let me just make sure there is just to a quick audio check make sure the sound is coming through um, Alright, well, let me just bring up the the people on facebook and youtube all right people all right so let me just one moment just taking out guys you're doing it you're doing it hazard ghazali king farabri all right people i take it you can all you can hear the sound coming through loud and clear Excellent, excellent, excellent. So, right. So, for tonight, people, Allahu Akbar. We have with us an esteemed guest. I'm just bringing up the profile picture for you on the screen right there. You can see tonight's guest, uh, Dr. Sara Atantawi from New York, people, the United States. Allahu Akbar. A professor at Fordham University in Islamic Studies. Um, herself, she's completed her master's and PhD at none other than Harvard itself. Let's bring on Damas y Caballeros. Let me present. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Ahlo wa sahlan, Dr. Sara. Ahlo wa sahlan. <laughs> wa alaykum as -salam. Shukran for taking the time out to join us tonight on Mind trap. Inviting me. All right. So I'm just uh, just doing a quick uh, just a sound check. Just want to make sure that with the guest as well, there has been on some occasions sometimes. Um, just guys, I take it you can all hear uh, Dr. Sarah loud and clear. So Sarah. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. You've had quite an um, quite an impressive academic journey. Um, you know, studying at, at a, such a prestigious place, uh, going through Islamic studies at Harvard, a master's, right through to a PhD. You've gone on to teach Islamic studies yourself. Tell us a bit about your your kind of inspiration to get into into this this journey this academic path that you've taken because it's not something that seems you know intuitively there for somebody in america to think well i know let me go to harvard and study islam <laughs> right. you know it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's uh you know it's not a a kind of go-to because it doesn't seem so lucrative it doesn't seem so you know it's not that society doesn't really reinforce it for us mm. so Mm -hmm. So shed some some of your insights on that. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, well, yes, you're right that it's it wasn't an obvious um, path. Well, actually, my undergraduate degree was in English literature and rhetoric, which I was at UC Berkeley, and rhetoric is kind of the equivalent of philosophy. So I was like, I can figure out the meaning of life through philosophy and literature. And then what happened was two things happened as an undergraduate. Um, one, I read Edward Said, and that was different. And uh, two, I was in a graduate class at the law school called Law in the Work of Art. Okay. And my professor said, rationality itself is a Western invention. Before the Western man, as he put it, humanity did not know what rationality was. And he put that at Descartes. You know, we did not know what rationality was. Now, of course, I grew up in a Muslim family. Um, I knew enough to know that that was not true. <laughs> I knew of the existence of something called kalam. 
I knew of that Muslim um, theologians had uh, employed rationality and thought about rationality. So at that point, I became interested in an intellectual sense in comparative philosophy. And so when I went, so then I, that was, uh, I was at Berkeley and then I, I said, I'm going to do my master's degree in Middle Eastern studies and I'm going to do comparative philosophy. Well, then I got to Harvard and it was the East Coast and it was, it was very different from Berkeley. And all of my classes were politics, language, history. I had soldiers in my classes. Um, I had future diplomats in my classes. And so I kind of was introduced to this whole other approach to education, which was a lot more concerned with, um, I would say, power. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, and that was very shocking to me. And I, I can't say that I had a fantastic time every moment of my life um, <laughs> realizing that this was the case. <laughs> but but I, I, I did learn a lot. And um, by the time I finished my master's degree in the in the, it was a two-year program, and in the summer between the two years, I did a, a program in the West Bank um, where I learned Arabic, and I saw the occupation firsthand, uh, visited Gaza, and that really changed my life. And then when I was finished with that, I went to Syria and wrote a travel guide um, for, it was like the best job ever. I was basically paid to go to every restaurant and hotel in Syria. <laughs> and write about it. So, and I didn't get paid anything beyond that, but that was fine, you know. And, and, and so, you and you left that job. <laughs> well, it ended. Yeah, they don't let you do that forever, unfortunately. Yeah, you finish the book and then they stop paying you, and then you have to cut. You have to leave. Yeah. So that was between my two years, and then I came back, finished my master's degree, and I thought, okay, I'm not going to go on. And I thought I was going to do a PhD in English, and I was going to be like this reader of literature. No. After I saw what I saw in Syria and in, in the West Bank and Gaza, I decided, OK, I need to do something else. But I didn't know what this was. Um, I graduated in June of 2001. Oh, wow. OK. And, and when were you at Syria doing? That was the summer of 2000 and I, in, in Palestine as well. So when I got back that fall, the Intifada broke out like the second Intifada broke out like um, three weeks after I left. Wow. So I was just very affected by all of this. I was quite young, you know, and I was, and I would still be affected today, but I was super affected. And so then June 2001, I didn't know what to do with myself. I went home to uh, Los Angeles and my aunt said, hey, why don't you volunteer at this American Muslim organization? And you can. And I thought, what? <laughs> and she said, yeah, you know, you can write. Uh, I thought, okay, well, I want to, I went and met with them and I said, okay, I can write a report about media coverage of the Middle East. And that's what I was really obsessed with. So I'm going to volunteer and, you know, they'll give me donuts and I'll live with my parents. I was quite the loser at that moment, but you know, I, I didn't have anything else to do with it. I just was figuring it out. So uh, September 1st, 2001 was my start date at this uh, organization. And then September 11th happened. Whoa. And yes. So I, I, my, my friend called me and said, turn on the television. And then I rushed over to the mosque. And then all of these microphones were being put in my face. You know, what is Islam? And I knew enough to say, you know, okay, Islam, five pillars. Is there, you know, I, so suddenly I'm doing all this media. And then within a month, I was moved. I had a job. And I was moved to Washington, D.C., right. where, <laughs> where I was doing um, just this, like, I call it the triage, you know, just this disaster after disaster, mm. you know, the... Um, damage control. I, damage control, exactly. <laughs> I did a lot of media. I did lobbying work. I really got to know Washington, D.C. And, um, and I learned a lot about the American Muslim community as well. And I began forming a lot of questions about Islam. I was traveling all over the country, visiting American Muslim communities, checking out how politics worked, looking at the scene, the American Muslim political scene and how it was functioning. And um, by the, you know, I'm very grateful to the organization I was working for, the Muslim Public Affairs Council, lovely people there. And, and um, you know, I, I'll always be grateful to them. By the time I finished, I was finishing up, you know, it was like three years in and I just thought, I agree with so much of the 
politics, but as a, it, I, I'm not, I'm, there's something missing in terms of a lot of things theologically and in terms of creating a wide enough net to include all of these Muslims I knew who were disaffected and who weren't participating in any of this and who were feeling the brunt of 9-11, but who wouldn't, didn't feel comfortable, for example, going to a mosque regularly. So at that point, I uh, got together with three friends and colleagues and we formed the Progressive Muslim Union. And, and then I moved to New York and did that kind of full time. And then I learned the difference between trying to organize among a more conservative community versus organizing among a more progressive community. Oh, and right. I realized the former is much easier than the latter, actually. <laughs> is it? <laughs> it is, surprisingly, because, you know, um, I mean, I'm sure there's social scientific research to back this up, but I, my theory is that more conservative folks um, are, just listen to authority more. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of, well, they didn't listen to me because I'm a woman, right? But I mean, you've got the, <laughs> if you, if you, but you got the, if you get the big guy to tell them to do yeah. things, they do it, you know, mm -hmm. give us money, do this, lobby here. But, um, so I saw that happening. But then when you're in the progressive community or people who are more artists, liberals, professors, you know, mm -hmm. everyone is an Opi island. Everyone opinionated, has, quite opinionated. Yeah. And, and Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Opinionated. Yeah. So that was like herding cats. Wow. And uh, yeah, I mean, interesting. And, and we, you know, I think we did succeed in widening the net. Um, but it, then they ended up breaking up actually around um, disputes about the Iraq war. Mm -hmm. So the Iraq war was starting and sort of some people thought sort of, I wouldn't say anyone. Well, there was one person at least that like very rah, rah, rah supported it. And there were a few others who thought, well, you know, maybe change has to come at the point of the, of the military. And then I would like to clarify that I was in the other camp, along with my uh, my three of the co-founders who thought, no, <laughs> we do not support the war in Iraq. This is not the way to go about things. And so um, we ended up resigning. And and that's when I decided to go back and do my Ph.D. in religion. Um, in Islam, Islamic studies, because I had just accumulated so many questions um, by that point. Mm, oh, and yeah, yes, yeah. And then yeah. something else happened that I'll tell you more. About. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. So PhD, Harvard, Islam, and your PhD was centered around... Oh, you're asking? Yes. No, yes. no, no. I mean, obviously, an Islam and Sharia, <laughs> but... But yeah. from from you, how how would you best explain okay. um, one obviously what it was centered around, but why? Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. So when I was working in DC, mm -hmm. um, I was the communications director of the organization I was working for, and I was in a meeting of major American Muslim leaders mm -hmm. um, who were mostly Arab and South Asian, um, and quite wealthy, right? Um, kind of power brokers in the American Muslim community. And my phone just kept ringing and ringing and ringing and ringing and ringing. And I kept ignoring it. And then I just, you know, I thought something must really be wrong. I'm getting a, a call every two seconds. So I ran out and started answering the calls. And it was CNN, BBC, MSNBC, you know, all of them saying, there's this woman who is being sentenced to death by stoning in Nigeria for committing adultery and can you please tell us in two bullet points, why is Islam so violent? Why is Islam stone people? Why does Islam hate women? And so um, that was my job, you know, to try to, uh, you know, reframe those questions. And But then I was like, what's going on? Let me let me figure out what's going on with this case and let me do a deep dive into this. And so the first thing I did was I went back into the meeting and I, I said, hey, can I interrupt for a minute? Um, I'm getting all of these calls about this woman who's, Stone being sentenced to death by stoning, what can you tell me about? I'm getting all these media calls. And they said, Sarah, stoning is not in Islam, and stoning only happens in Africa. Hmm. And they were wrong on both points. <laughs> so I thought, <laughs> I thought, why, why are they wrong on both points? And what's going on? And um, there's, and then, and then, so that's on the American Muslim side, just kind of like totally denying that there was the stoning punishment and 
kind of pinning it on Africa, which is not true at all. And then um, the other side of the spectrum, I have all these people calling me about very concerned about this one woman who might be sentenced to death by stoning, which of course, you know, I obviously that's terrible. I don't support that. But this is 2002, the run up to the Iraq war. And I'm just every day waking up in this like horrible hellscape in which, you know, people are clinically discussing, you know, will it be 150,000 dead or 200,000 dead? And just having these very kind of clinical conversations about that. So I really noticed a difference in the level of outrage, right? Yeah. So there's this extreme outrage about this one woman. And then there's these like clinical conversations about this, you know, impending destruction of an entire country and society. So I thought, okay, that's also interesting. So I wanted to explore all of those things. So when I, I'm like, I'm the person that when I got to my PhD, I had my dissertation topic on day one. I really wanted to figure out what is going on with stoning, Nigeria, this case, the Western reaction, all of it. So that that's how I got interested. And, and this is a... Uh, a fascinating kind of question, really, a fascinating phenomenon that this longing that Muslims have for the Sharia, let's say, or this alleged longing. And this is obviously part of what, what you were investigating, but it's something a lot of people are asked that, you know, Muslims want the Sharia. This, this is the question that, you know, Muslims want Sharia everywhere. And one of the, people are like, well, why on earth do they want it? Yeah. This is, this is what people are asking, isn't it? Yeah. Right. I mean, you see, and this is something I've said before as well, that, you see, this is a, uh, this is really a false dichotomy presented to Muslims. Uh, when when this question is asked that do you want sharia people feel that of course this question translates as do you whose side are you, do you place yourself on the side of god or the side of man and people will have a loyalty to god to say well of course god but what is it that they in their minds understand when they say sharia um and this is something that you've uh, obviously you're very incredibly focused on in in studying, isn't it? So what what did you find? Yeah, I mean that's like the question because when when I like you said, kind of in the Western discourse or even in the non-reflective Muslim discourse, it's like of course we want Sharia, of course we want Sharia, and then the Western discourse is all Muslims are born wanting Sharia, and it's like okay, well, what does that mean? Yeah. What is it? So. I went to Nigeria and I simply asked people, "Why? what is Sharia? Why do you want it? And I ended up formulating a, a kind of dichotomy. It's in my book. It's the difference between idealized Sharia, the ideal, and political Sharia, which is not my term. That's Nigerians' terms, term for what actually happens when the ideal enters into the realm of politics, hmm. which, as far as I can tell, is always disappointing. Um, so the ideal is, so it's case by case in some way. It's, so it's, as you said, it's God's law. So this is the thing that's so dangerous about playing with this in the political realm is when you have all of these sincere people in Nigeria, in Pakistan, in Egypt, everywhere that are saying there are sincere Muslims. And of course they want God's law. But when you, if you're a cynical politician and you're sort of playing with that, the public will reject you eventually because they don't want that ideal to be messed with because they believe it, you know. So what they really wanted in the case in Nigeria, I would boil it down to an end to poverty and corruption. Hmm. And so, you know, and, and poverty is quite obvious. It, it's actually the same problem because the disparity in wealth is really very unbelievable. Nigeria should be one of the wealthiest countries in the world. It has huge oil reserves, amazing natural resources. Um, but it's um, it was actually the year that the Sharia, I call it the Sharia revolution, but the year that people started marching on the street for Sharia, Nigeria was actually ranked the second most corrupt country in the world. So 
you know, you have, <laughs> I actually saw a scene, for example, of like a dirt road with like goats, you know, wandering and, and people sitting on the sides, you know, making food. And then you go down the end of the dirt road and then there's a governor's mansion where there are like 15 Mercedes Benzes just in the maids quarters. You know, I mean, the level of disparity with, yeah. behind all the iron gates. So people are seeing this. And they want an end to that. That's what that's what they want Sharia to do. End that. And and another key thing here, uh, Doctor Sarah, is that mm-hmm. you see, there's a key, uh, there's an, a, a very important distinction to be made between Sharia and Fiqh, and what people uh, because <laughs> when people say we want Sharia, what is not in their mind is yeah. we want a Fiqh book. <laughs> Indeed not. Indeed not. No, I mean, Sharia is an ideal in and of itself, right? And fiqh is the manifestation of that ideal, and people want the ideal. So yes, you're absolutely right. They're not thinking, oh, we want a reduced version of Sidi Khali's Muhtasir to rule us, which is what ended up happening. That Nobody said that, you know? Yeah. Um, so what they... But they believe in God's justice. So that is what they were calling for. And this is why as soon, I mean, people are smart, you know, as soon as they saw that the politicians, so there were a lot, I'm going to be fair, there were a lot of sincere people in Nigeria who were trying to implement what I call idealized Sharia. But how do you do it? I mean, the, the first thing they do is they turn to the fiqh books and, and, and then there's this pressure to be quick and do it overnight. Mm-hmm. And they have to contend with the fact that Nigeria, Nigeria is a secular country. It has a constitution. It has magistrate courts. So yeah. um, there's time pressure to like reduce the Sharia. You're not going to have this like flowing legal system that exists organically, such as in like the midst of the Ottoman Empire, happen overnight if you're tr- if you're in a nation state. In a diverse nation state, drawn colonial borders, you know, like Nigeria, for example. So um, you ended up with this kind of reduced legal code with just bullet points. And I think that's why punishments like stoning end up becoming much easier to meet out in that context, because it's also reduced. If you do this wrong or that wrong, you get stoned. It's 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 funny because uh, I mean it's not funny at all but I mean it's it's strange that the that stoning regime uh, is has become the icon for Sharia. It's you know if people if a country was to say we're going to instate Sharia, the icon you know the uh, icon the icon for that is simply that they will stone people to death now. That is. Yeah. I mean, how did it even get to that? I mean, what? That's a great question. <laughs> you know, there is evidence in, um, so in Nigeria, uh, until 1903, from 1809 to 1903, it was ruled by a caliphate, the Sokoto Caliphate. And it's a, um, it was a caliphate of native sons, you know, ruling themselves. And this is a time that most people look on with pride. And if you look at the polemical literature of the people who started that caliphate, they actually talk about specifically isolating stoning as something that people need to take seriously because of talhif. There's a sense that, or deterrence, there's a sense that stoning is the most gruesome punishment and it's the punishment that can prove to the masses that this is a serious legal system that we're, we mean business, you know, that, that there's teeth behind this. And that same attitude was present in the Nigerians, many of the, the supporters that, of Sharia that I spoke to. No, like, we mean business with this. We're going to stone you. Now, I don't think anyone in either of those contexts imagined mass stonings. This is deterrence. But there's that sense of, like, it, it gives, it's a legitimizing <clears throat> severity. Yeah. I mean, because a lot of people generally, when they think of Islam, like if if you were to say, well, we're going to rule by Islam, the the kind of default backdrop understandings that come to their minds are one, the concept of justice, 
Like they feel that there will be justice. Two, people feel that there will be some kind of welfare. Like maybe, you know, they hope that there will be like hospitals that can now cater for people. There will be some kind of education. You know, we're not going to be extorted financially. We're not going to. I mean, these are the, the, the fundamentals, which are just general values that, you know, are in the world today, which especially like, let's say what people look at the modern world, ironically, and they, they will see this as just pure kufar, but these are the same values fundamentally that they too will be aspiring to, because that is ultimately what Islam would be that, you know, mm-hmm. that it is just Allah is just commanding you with by justice and compassion uh, that had to have good ethics. So, yeah, but I, I, I do find it so shocking that how, especially in recent times, Hudud is the, the poster for Sharia. It is the, you know, it is, it is the, 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 the kind of the menu. It is, every, it is what at the advertising for Sharia to say, well, we're going to have Hudud right. in place. Yeah, <laughs> the, the advertising is a very good word. Yeah. yeah, and it comes from the Muslim side and the Western side. Mm, yeah, and I feel in some ways it it's also and it's quite easy to to be actionable to some extent, mm-hmm. as opposed to saying let's start having justice, because justice <laughs> is like uh, like how the hell do you go about having justice? <laughs> yeah, that's what the Sharia commissions were trying to figure out. It's so interesting because a lot of the time what ends up happening is that they just, I don't know what it is, but they end up focusing on women. Yeah. Kind of, hmm. I mean, because th- th- do, do you not feel that there is this, um, you see, there's this kind of mindset that with time, there is a decadence that is taking place, a moral decadence and that yeah. moral decadence is strongly associated with women becoming more and more corrupt as well that's like a strong salient feature of that decadence that you know look oh my god women are not dressed properly or women are you know and and anything that claims to reign in control on women seems to kind of make people think oh we're going to control the decadence and this kind of depravity within society um i think you really nailed it on the head there yeah to to, <laughs> to control women is to control the chaos is yeah. to, it's to rein things in um also i mean i think that's i think that's true it's also just a kind of social fact that women are tend to be weaker in these societies so they can't fight back i mean everyone doing because you know i spoke to women one of the nice things about the fact that i did this research is is that i'm a woman so women will talk to me uh it's kind of hard to talk to women sometimes in these societies and it actually took me a long time to get some of them to warm up to me but you'd be surprised a lot of the i mean first of all i knew this but the women are super smart and they see they see what's happening and um in fact, it was women that made up the term political sharia. Like they knew that because these are all kind of men. Again, some of the men were very sincere, but some were very corrupt. And some were using the sharia experiment to just get more power for themselves. Women can see right through this, you know, and um, and they know intuitively that, you know, this isn't really sharia. This is some other thing the guys are doing. And so they just but it's, you know, you can you can um, impose your will on women because they don't have as much power. Hmm. And and it comes back to that thing as well, that this is, an, uh, I mean, relatively speaking, it's an easier, actionable um, kind of course to, to say, well, right, women can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. Um it's it's much easier than trying to say okay let's set up a system that's going to deal with hospital care and let's going to set up a health system or let's set up i mean those things will take years in the making and right. they, they require an infrastructure to say well right okay women can no longer leave their homes with without their heads mm-hmm. covered 
it's a very it's 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 very actionable it's it's you know it's enforceable quite swiftly and it it makes people think oh yes you know we are now controlling this kind of you know morality is coming back to us <laughs> that's right it's absolutely the, oh look sharia is working you know the women are uh, they can no longer ride on the back of a motorcycle with one man they have to find another way or they have to wear a different kind of hijab or they yeah it's it's a quick fix and it's also um visual mm, yeah yeah exactly i mean some some people were asking and uh just here <laughs> mm -hmm. so i thought i'd just mention i have spoken about this previously that mm -hmm. um my uh, about hudud because we've mentioned stoning uh, mm -hmm. my, I have got videos on this that my understanding is in line with several of the Malikis of the past who had stated uh, there's a famous scholar from the around the 7th century of Islam, Abu Qasim al-Burzuli, and he had stated that the hudud change with the day and age. So his mm -hmm. famous fatwa was to substitute the hudud for financial penalties. Mm -hmm. And this was then followed up for centuries by different ulama of the Maghrib. So um, and that's something I, and I, I've got videos under trajectory hermeneutics explaining all of that. But that has been my perspective that the hudud do change, as was done in, in, in the East as well by uh, the some of the Ottoman Suleiman al-Qanuni changing a lot of the, the kind of Qanun and stuff. But um, this thing, I mean, coming there, there were some um, some questions here as well. I mean, that you might get a lot as well, uh, and one of them, namely about hijab, and, and mm -hmm. you know, like this, this is something people just—it's almost like a knee-jerk kind of mm. reaction that you're probably very uh, I mean, accustomed to dealing it. with. Yeah, <laughs> you know, people will be like, "Oh my God, how can this?" A woman be speaking about, uh, let's say, Sharia and not wear a hijab. Now, by the way, my my own uh, clips on hijab and my views are that the head covering is not necessarily part of the hijab. It's more modesty is what the the Quran in essence is speaking about, and there isn't something uh, from the Quran or Sunnah clearly that speaks of a you know this. Uh, now we call it hijab, but uh, whether it was the khimar in that sense but over to you i mean this is something that you uh, probably have faced a lot unfortunately hmm. is that happening now i uh, can't no, see. no there, there was a okay. comment so i just oh, thought okay. well okay. <laughs> there was right. uh it, you know there there, there were there were a few there were a, a few people just yeah. curious ah okay like why i don't wear hijab yeah yeah but. as in as in yeah so the well, I don't wear hijab because it's not part of my – my mother doesn't wear hijab. My grandmother barely wore hijab. It's not part of my – and they're all Muslims. Uh, my Both of my grandfathers were Muslim scholars. Um, and so I, I have a very kind of firm understanding that Islam comes from other factors um, besides hijab. And it, it's not something that's been – a very, it's not something that anyone has ever. Um, I mean, I do have some uncles now who are trying, but you know, uh, the tactic is to say, You look so much better with it on. <laughs> uh, but it's not, I'm not against, but it's not, it's, um, I just don't. It, it it shouldn't have to be something which yeah it's, it's not a and it shouldn't have to be something which is a validating factor no and uh, you know but I'm stubborn I mean to the extent that it is something that people want me to do to be validating to them I'm not going to do it that's insincere yeah you know it has to come from me it had would have to be something I want to do and I'm not bowing to pressure to satisfy strangers you know. That's and, not going to happen. And so. I, f I find it quite ironic that people mm -hmm. will, um, mm -hmm. let's say they will engage a discussion. Um, it could be something on TV. They could be watching, mm -hmm. let's say, a documentary or watching something. They could be uh, a woman mm -hmm. explaining something. Uh, but mm -hmm. the moment it is oh, a Muslim woman, 
Mm. Oh, it becomes now, well, oh, well, hmm, you know, what what happened to hijab? And you think, well, <laughs> you know, the, the, the these these kind of points, in essence, it's just something to debilitate kind of dialogue, debilitate mm. um, discussion, debilitate to, to kind of like break things down. I this this is I, I just find it ironic. I do wonder where it's coming from, you know, that um, like why. Yeah. Why is there a need to place a lot of barriers for women to talk? Mm. Um, uh, it's interesting when I was doing a lot of media, you know, I was defending Muslims and I was really taking on some difficult topics on the American national media and I've never worn hijab, so I wasn't wearing hijab at the time. And most people were like, well, thank you so much for, you know, being against the Iraq war on the on the O'Reilly factor and dealing with death threats the next day. So we're going to give her a really big pass. But, you know, one or two people would always say, well, what about the hijab? And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> you can buy yourself a lot of not getting that feedback if you are kind of defending the community. Um, but the moment you want to, I mean, I don't know. I just think, um, if you look at anyone and kind of disqualify them based on something that they're wearing or not wearing, you know, that's kind of your problem to figure out why that's so. I personally find that it is, it is, uh, it is something yeah. within people <laughs> who feel they have an, a kind of inherent authority to just try and tell people off. And there's, and there's nothing better than religion to, to as a tool for that. I see. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just feel, yeah. I, I just feel that, that, that this is people feel that they have this kind of like birthright to tell other people off always. And and that's uh, just and religion is the best way to say, well, God says so. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah, I mean, um, it does happen more from men than women. It, it, it has occasionally happened from women, but actually it's mostly men. Yeah, it's mostly, it'll Say mostly that. just be men, to be fair. Right. So I can't, I mean, maybe you can, you can tell me what's going on probably better than, <laughs> than no, I I'm, No, I mean, I, I, I just thought that's an interesting, but on that, uh, following on from that discussion, I mean, what is, as a woman who's been, um, studying the Sharia, conducting studies, discussing it, uh, creating an awareness on a lot of these intricate topics. What do you feel are certain um, areas, especially to do with women, that need to be brought to the forefront? That, do, you know, as, as a woman, as an active uh, Muslim woman, I mean, especially when it comes to Islam, what do you, what do you, because it's, I mean, this is one of the, the big things right now, isn't it? That this whole thing about, uh, you know, women, Islam, as soon as Islam is mentioned, I mean, because a lot of people will be upset as well. Um, sometimes you, you get a reaction, um, you know, that Islam is misogynistic uh, and you do get, you know, people pushing these tendencies as well. Uh, I mean, what are your... I don't know if you've um, had much engagement on the mm -hmm. on that area. Well, I mean, generally, I think we focus on the on we often focus on the wrong issues. So, for example, people get really, really upset. I, you know, I would say I don't have a statistical analysis, and I don't want to upset anyone, but <laughs> upset them, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> my uh, my impression is that, for example, people get more. Some people, not everyone, sure. but some people. I don't know. I don't know. You know, one thing that needs to be determined is like YouTube comments. How representative is yeah, that exactly. of humanity? Like, that's what I don't know because. Uh, probably, hopefully not very, <laughs> but yeah, you know, no. <laughs> but it seems people get more upset about, okay, she's not wearing hijab or let's say this country right now, people are very upset about France, which yes, it does have some, it seems to be going in a fascistic direction, yeah. but are you as upset about, um, FGM, hmm. um, th that's being justified by Islam Are seriously, are you upset as upset about that? Are you as upset about um, 
the lack of education for women in various parts of the Muslim majority world, the high levels of depression, the, all of the issues that, you know, once in, in Nigeria, the, the rates of HIV, the fact that polygamy means uh, that mass polygamy means that so many women don't know where their husbands are and are susceptible to huge rates of HIV. Are you as upset about that, at least as upset as, you know, hijab and France and all the kind of Western generated issues. And I don't see that. Mm -hmm. And I find that very problematic because for several reasons, one, it's a bit hypocritical yeah. Two, the Muslim issues are the ones we can do something about more easily. Yeah. Right. They're the ones that we have some sphere of influence. We could get together. We could organize, um, and it will improve the lot of Muslims. I mean, exactly. how, what's the best way to, to create, you know, to improve all of these situations, even the ones in which Western governments are becoming more fascistic? Yeah. I would say elevate the Muslim ummah. Yeah. And, and so concentrate on that. So that that's where I yeah. kind of... I mean, this FGM for, thing that you said is yeah. so important because it's it's... It's interesting that a lot of the, where it is found in some of the countries, like whether it's Malaysia, uh, some mm -hmm. parts of Africa, Indonesia, a lot of them leaning in on the Shafi'i fiqh, which mm -hmm. seems to be kind of encouraging, promoting, borderline mandating in certain kind of, uh, you know, fatawa. And mm -hmm. it's like... You see, it's there in the Muslim world, as in we've Muslims know about it. But at the same time, it's like everybody pretends that it's not. It's a non-issue. Like they, like people will be like, I don't even know what you're talking about. So, yeah, it's it's interesting that there's so many important issues that are just so sidelined altogether and and completely considered non-existent, although yeah. they 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 are and and they have their roots in Islamic discussion, whereas, you know, because you've got ulama that are promoting it, that are teaching, even though they may not be horrible people. I'm not trying right. to say that these ulama are like some kind of like, oh, butchers out there, but they, right. but they, you know, they, they are teaching. The yeah, banality. Yeah. Of, yeah. Yeah. And they're just teaching it. And no, and other ulama that disagree with them are not really creating a platform of discourse to challenge it with them by trying right. to say look guys you know this what the hell you know this is we need to deal with this yeah. so yeah that's um but well, I, one, yeah go ahead sorry no 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 sorry please oh i just was the reason that particular issue is on my mind is because of the recent death of Nawala sadawi in egypt Right, and yes. she really campaigned uh, more than any one single figure against the very high rates of FGM in Egypt. And she wasn't a perfect person like none of us are. She had very critical commentary about, um, I think I would say, religious dogma. Um, and she really, you know, in her own work, she saw a connection between that and these kind of misogynistic attitudes that m created the conditions that made FGM so hard to eradicate. And she just died a few weeks ago. And some of the reaction, the, 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 the hatred, the detestation yeah. of this woman, because she doesn't wear hijab, yeah. because said something critical about Islam at one point, yeah. you know, not even and taking her totally out of context because, she, you know, and it's like that disproportionality, like it's, I can't respect that. Exactly. You know, this woman spent 50 years, you know, um, really suffering. She was campaigning and, and, you know, and then this weird jealousy because the West also recognizes her as someone important. Uh, and I, that's another thing I don't understand. There's so many, um, and it comes from a lot of people who are maybe in the more political Islam persuasion and who are sheikhs maybe themselves or religious leaders. And they just keep hammering her because she had a few visiting fellowships in the West or Time Magazine put her on the cover. And it's like, you're all in the West. <laughs> All of the statements are in the West. That's why I don't get it, you know. So it there's all of that is just I can't, you know, I yeah. can't rational mind suffers. Yeah, know? I mean I didn't yeah. uh, I don't know too much about uh Noel uh 
I just ca- came across her as mm-hmm. she passed because a lot of people were speaking about her mm. all of a sudden on social media. So I was thinking, well, who is this lady? I don't, I, I don't know who she is. And so, uh, and to be honest, a lot of what I was just reading were were negative comments about her by Muslim yeah. clerics. Uh, trying to say, well, you know, this this woman, you know, basically saying good riddance, in, in other yeah, words. Yeah, awful. Yeah, it was so hateful. And so I, I, yeah. I was thinking, well, who, who is this? And and to be fair, I, I initially, as soon as I saw that, I sensed suspicion because I felt that, you know, whenever people behave in that way, especially clerics, mm-hmm. <laughs> there's usually uh, the person, you know, the, the, that's not usually the story. So... Mm. Yeah, then I did learn that, okay, that she was somebody that was uh, an activist, she was Egyptian, and that she had uh, critiqued certain views and it had upset people. Uh, that's what I'd, I'd come to learn. I didn't realise she was uh, one of the, the actual project, <clears throat> like FGM, etc. Mm-hmm. But I know she was outspoken in criticising uh, the, you know, the clergy and stuff like this and... She was also out. I think what one of the things that really enrages the clerics, I think, is that she was outspoken about the way that hijab is instrumentalized by um, religious authorities to create conformity in women or the conditions for that's her reading, you know. And yeah. there's a difference between hijab being a uh, fard or a or a symbol of Islam that women can freely choose and her argument which is that you guys are using this issue to to forward your own agenda and i think there's a lot of truth to her argument and this enrages them because i mean i've seen it firsthand when i worked at american muslim organizations i saw women being asked okay well we're gonna go on this march in front of the camera so could you wear hijab for that and then you know you can take it off if afterwards or so i mean she's not wrong people do instrumentalize this um so you know and there's almost this push yeah. to to mm-hmm. to kind of to to want people to acknowledge that they are now outside of the fold or they are outside mm-hmm. of this kind of mainstream islam by saying this so mm-hmm. people you know they it's like they will be happy to know that this person now is not a Muslim or this person is <laughs> not a, you know, because yeah, then, mm-hmm. yeah, because it makes it, it's, it, it compartmentalizes it for them. Yeah. Oh, well, oh, well, you're a kafir anyway, you know, you're, uh, or you're not part of mainstream Islam, you're not part of this kind of, uh, th- th- this rhetoric is unfortunately so common. So. Yeah, it has gotten worse. That particular in-group, out-group, yeah. you have to display the identity of, of the way we define it or not. My observation is that that's gotten worse, that it used to be more fluid. But I could be wrong. Um, yeah, I'm a new Twitterer. So I, you know, I just feel like the world is so much more like black and white, cancel, non-cancel, you're good, you're bad. You what, do you, what do you think has led to this? Because, you know, in the last few decades, because you've mentioned this in a uh, in your talk as well, and uh, you've done a talk for those people who haven't uh, seen it alongside with Sheikh Yasser Qadi and uh, Dr. Muqtadar Khan. And it, that was on blasphemy and profanity within Islam. But in there as well, you mentioned that, look, uh, the world seems to have now gotten worse like the muslim scene we're speaking about and and i agree it's something which many people have said i've said it on my monday nights with mufti on several occasions that look um that uh, uh, that especially in the last maybe 30 40 years things yeah. have got quite worse um what do you think are the the contributing factors to that what what has kind of nurtured that element you know, especially in light of political Islam, I mean, in light Would of that. Would you say it's gotten worse in the Muslim majority world as well? as I think it's gotten worse in the West. No, I think it has in the Muslim majority world too in terms of, yeah, the in-group, out-group dynamics. Would you agree with that? 100% that is- because I had said, mm-hmm. in fact, a couple of months ago, I was discussing 
and I was speaking about the kind of Mujahideen era, mm. uh, and and I mentioned that you see geopolitics. Um, that one, there was obviously there's been decades of instability within the post-colonial kind of instability that's happened. Uh, countries trying to get back and stabilize, and obviously economic issues, poverty, um, and then seeing. You see, it's not just that, but it's when you see because we're social creatures. When we see other humans kind of progressing happily towards mm. something, and we don't have it, it makes it worse. You know, if everybody's suffering, it's not yeah. as bad. But when, if I'm just suffering and you're living the life, yeah. <laughs> then it's yeah. then it's bad <laughs> for me. Yeah. It's bad. So people are seeing this. Uh, mm-hmm. Then there is unquestionably. I I mentioned that, <clears throat> you know, with the American ex- uh, foreign policies of trying to uh, the CIA trying to stop the Russian. Um, you know, the whole communism thing, the war on communism mm. and kind of encourage, just giving a green light to Muslim lands to encourage the Mujahideen movement. Yeah. So yeah. this Mujahideen movement right across the pulpits throughout, you know, many Muslim countries was like, yeah, jihad, jahid al-kuffar, jahid al-kuffar. And, and people going off, you know, this is the era of bin Laden. This is the era of these people going off the Taliban or the, or it wasn't the Taliban, but the pre Versus to the Taliban, the Mujahideen of Afghanistan and people from Pakistan going in and other countries flooding in. And and these there's a whole generation being nurtured. And, mm. you know, this goes on for so long. And places like Pakistan, for example, the madrasas have been built, who people have graduated, gone back, built more madrasas, who've gone back now, people have graduated, built more madrasas. It's like you've got a generation of... Mm people that have been brought up on this Mujahideen kind of backdrop uh, where where Islam, its primary purpose is to rule the world, Mm. where Kuffar are kind of really their only purpose is to be ruled by Muslims, you know, Mm. this this dominion. And it's 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 like lurking now as a kind of cancer Mm. um, in, in the background. And I feel that it's. I don't know. How do you get rid of this then? How do you get rid of it? Yeah. I agree with you completely. Um, and there's milder forms of it. You know, not everyone's like, okay, we need to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, you know, I just, I'm shocked by what I even see on YouTube. With I, I can't believe we're at a point where you're just calling everyone, everything is kuf. Everyone's a, a kafir. I mean, I, this is new. You know, this is, and these upstarts. You know, who who are they? What are their qualifications? They just have a camera. And they're calling people kuf to left and right. Mm-hmm. And because they are, it's almost like they're very extreme. So they get all these followers. Yeah. And so that's enough to have authority. We have a crisis of authority in general. You know, yeah. before yeah. with, with Al-Qaeda, it, it, in that jihad, Mujahideen era, as you were talking about, okay, that was more about the money, the weapons, the, you know, the oil money, the weapons, etc. Now there's, it's a little more diversified. Now there's this social media, internet influence. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I mean, I mean what you... I meant, what what I meant, you see, with mm-hmm. that era, there was the there was the 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 warfare element, the fighting element, but mm-hmm. there was the normalizing of this narrative. This narrative of us versus them, this yeah. narrative of being firm against the kuffar. Um, yeah. Now, it got normalized to a great extent. Now, even though, you know, move on a few decades, people are not now talking about let's go fight. But that that kind of the, the normality of that backdrop is still there with the older generation who are still mm. around and they are the yeah. people who you know are have have money they are the people who have things influence and so it's yeah so yeah. it's yeah i mean one way of looking at political islam in a broad way is that you know islam went from it's funny and i'm teaching political islam this week in my class and last week we i, I did a, a week on sufism and it occurred to me that one thing I could say is that if Sufism is the focus on the internal, yes. political Islam is basically the exact opposite. It's the it's in this a perspective on Islam that's completely focused on the external. 
Right. Yeah, that's you know? a good point. Yeah. And so that is where we are. You know that the. Um, I do think that's getting a little bit. It's it's changing a bit. Um, yeah, I, I I feel that too. I okay. Feel that, yeah. I feel that, um, especially you see what seems to be happening with the proliferation of information and and that's like a two you know double sided double edged kind mm -hmm. of blade, uh, because it's got the nutcases out there doing the mm -hmm. kind of preaching, but mm -hmm. I feel that in the Muslim countries. Um, mm -hmm. The kind of middle classes have mm -hmm. kind of had enough. Uh, yeah. They're kind of really fed up with religion yeah. as it is. And yeah. the middle classes of the Muslim world, they, mm -hmm. they, they kind of relate to, let's say, uh, the country, whether it's Western countries or, other, or more developed countries. It's kind of like a similar culture around the world of being of just seeking, you know, things that because because pe people are they they do want to i feel that people do want ethical values they yes. want these things but they just fed up with certain you know like the, this is not uh islam so right now in um, pakistan for example I, i'm not i haven't been following it closely but there's been this whole uh, kind of demonstrations going on. I don't know if they still are, but they were going on l last week. And it was to do with a particular group that had been deemed a bit extremist. Uh, they, uh, surprisingly, they, they were a Sufi group, but it was on the back of blasphemy blasphemy mm. laws so they mm. kind of rose and they they kind of glorified murdering anybody who blasphemes and recently with the with the cartoons in france they had done all these demonstrations saying you know kick out the french ambassador and um obviously the government wasn't doing it so they taken to the streets recently and you know they they just like they, they were borderline kind of almost like mini riots taking place and people you know destruction property this that and and the public are getting mobilized on the back of this it's out of love for the 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 honor of the prophet whereas you know it's it's an easy emotion to tap into whereas Really, it's 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 got you know it's not really got anything to do with the prophet, the, the honor of the prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi right. Wasallam. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, and and so you could you see this is going on in the streets, but there's things like COVID. There's people in hospitals. There's uh, mm -hmm. ambulances are not being allowed to pass. There's you know supplies can't go through. Now a lot of the regular middle classes that are yeah. seeing this they they obviously hating it and they yeah. um, they and they're hating with it the religion or the yeah. the yeah. that version of the religion they're thinking this is just you know it's holding us back yeah exactly um yes, yes. and you know and and that whole movement has had several decades now it's like okay go ahead you you've got the floor you know you you are the popular resistance to everything and they haven't accomplished anything what have they accomplished for people it hasn't really been a successful movement one must say you know the the kind of political islam mujahideen i mean it's they can create some social services where there are vacuums um by these mostly terrible regimes in in the region but they don't have the long-term solutions. I mean, we live in a very complicated world, so we need kind of all kinds of participation. It's not just slogans, you know, um, keeping people down. That's not going to develop countries or fix these really huge problems. So I think also the, the middle classes, like you're saying, are just noticing that this isn't a solution. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and yeah. and speaking of countries that have tried to, you know, uh, take this Islamic route or try to bring about some Islamic, uh, I don't know, political change. Egypt, uh, this whole, mm. the, the you know, the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood, also a a reflection of this era that we're speaking of, this, yeah. this whole, uh, we are suffering. We can see certain countries are doing well in the world. Certain people, we can see, we, you know, and that adds to our own suffering as people because we compare and yeah. we want some kind of we're kind of desperate for some kind of salvific 
you know, something, some salvation. And people say Allah is the salvation and God's rule will bring that. And so tell us a bit about that, because that's an area that is very close to your heart as well. <laughs> the whole, uh, this is another area where hopefully I don't get in too much trouble. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's all trouble. It's all trouble. It is all trouble. It's all trouble. I often say that if, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why I didn't get into botany. We could have all just been studying flowers right now. But no. <laughs> Special study. mushrooms. Think about it, people. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All these fun things that, no, nope, we're just talking about jihad. And, um, well, I mean, so... Egypt had a revolution, as everyone knows, in 2011, and that revolution was organized by youth. Uh, we call them the revolutionary youth. Mm -hmm. And while some members, individual members of the Muslim Brotherhood joined the youth, the organization itself um, hung back and really can't be said that they played a major role in organizing and carrying out the revolution. Um, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood started in Egypt in 1928, and it's had a long history that's complicated. But in from where we stand now, well, now is a different story. Where we stand in 2011, um, after so many years and decades of oppression, followed by uh, a really uh, major influence on the social plane, like I, I'm kind of in danger of going through the whole history of Egypt right now, which we do not want to do. But um, uh, th it had really become a very closed group. It's hard to join the Brotherhood and really get up the ranks. So it's a very closed private group. And so they, they, can, they have their own interests in mind when they make political moves. So they did not enthusiastically join in with the revolution. However, once the revolution was successful, they sort of the accusation is that, you know, they promised that they wouldn't run for the presidency because for for generations now, um, the Islamists have been really the only group allowed to influence society. They really had a major influence in universities, in professional syndicates. And whereas, let's say, the left was really put down. And there are other reasons. I mean, one interesting question is like, why did the Islamists survive so much when the left is so easily crushed. Um, and uh, that's a really fascinating question. It does have to do, I think, to some degree with their strong beliefs. And is it, is, it, is it not also an element that people, they, because your common person has yeah. a soft spot for, for, the, for the faith. And they, value, right. and they see it's dignified and respectable. Yes, and, that's right. And so anybody who holds that corner, no matter how they are, they they will take a bit of that dignity because it's it's Islam after all. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'm not saying that the Muslim Brotherhood themselves aren't dignified. There are many members of that I've personally met who are extremely dignified. Um, but to the degree that it's that Islam is used, now I'm thinking more broadly, by the all of these currents of political Islam mm -hmm. to kind of hit that spot with people who are often really suffering uh, just repeatedly to try to get political power, it really, I think, needs to stop, to be honest with you. Uh, it's really becoming seriously problematic um, because th that is a way to get power, but it's not the same thing as governance. It's not the same thing as solving problems. It's not the same thing as making meaningful alliances with all sectors of society. It's not the same thing as dealing with minorities. And, and you know, it's, so it's, it's really problematic um, and we kind of basically saw that in Egypt. The, the the Brotherhood did field a presidential candidate in 2013 or 2012 when they said they wouldn't. Um, a lot of going back on their word as well. They ran for parliament um, when they promised that they would only contest a maximum of 25% of seats, but they contested all of them, won about 73% um, when Morsi was president. So now... In that year that, that the Muslim Brotherhood won, actually barely won the popular the election uh, by less than a point. Okay. Um, so which is interesting in and of itself, considering that the opponent was a member of Mubarak's regime. And they still only won. So see, the, a vote for the Muslim Brotherhood was a vote for the revolution to a lot of people. 
Yeah. Uh, and yet they still only won by a little bit because there really is a, quite a lot of people who did not trust them. Um, because they, it's a closed group. I mean, we, you know, so anyway, but they did win and they took power and a lot of people gave them a chance and a lot of people didn't from the beginning. And it is true, of course, that the military, so the military, I mean, we'd have to have a whole other conversation about the military's game. The military, I've been doing a lot of reading on this lately, and it seems pretty clear that the military um, SCAF, the military unit that took power after the revolution, with pressure from, uh, more than I had really realized, with serious pressure from the United States. Okay. Really made it more easy, let's say, some would call it handed over the country to the Muslim Brotherhood. Like, okay, these people need to have a chance. Um, and how they did that is kind of interesting. But anyway, um, so the military was interfering with the Brotherhood's reign, but not as much as a lot of people say. In fact, it was the Brotherhood that made all these alliances with Sorry, the... Sorry, there's uh, just, this, it's, it's just some noise coming through. Uh, ah. Right. Okay. okay, seems to have seems to have stopped. Okay, oh. sorry. So, right. Um, so. I'm probably hitting things as I rant about Egypt. Which is... <laughs> so, it's... um, sorry. No, 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 yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Carry on, yeah. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood chose to make alliances with the military when they probably should have concentrated on making alliances with the people who actually started and organized the revolution. Mm -hmm. And then the military turned on them and the people ended up turning on them. And I think that is a, that's a very interesting point that I think a lot of people um, are not really grasping. I really believe there was a popular revolt against Islamism in Egypt in 2013. And then the military came and um, did, made a coup uh, and then got rid of, but they could not have done it without the popular. Mm -hmm. so, so I call it a popularly backed coup. Uh, people argue about this point. A lot of people don't like it when I say this, but it really is my real opinion based on what I observed. Um, I think a lot of people would agree with me on this. So yeah. now the problem is that the military now are, you know, totalitarian. And that's basically <laughs> a whole other story. Um, a little more complex also than it's sometimes portrayed but the problem is you know there's the Rabah massacre which was absolutely horrible yeah. uh, it was the massacre of the Muslim Brotherhood um, in August of 2013 so it's very hard to not see this as all a big tragedy that the Muslim Brotherhood are simply a, a tragic kind of story hmm. but I mean I think the objective reality is that it's a little more complicated than that um, and although there's no justifying what happened these massacres with the massacre so um so i think because of the tragedy of the massacre we are not as willing to really admit that there was a popular revolt against islamism and i just think that we need to understand that pretty clearly as western analysts uh, to really see where the region uh to see that because what's confusing to like your average western thinker is like wait a minute why would these muslims revolt against the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, not understanding that there are several different approaches to Islam and that Islamism is a different phenomena than Islam, you know. And so it's my observation that the pe most of the people who revolted against the Muslim Brotherhood were Muslims and conservative Muslims. It was not just liberals. No, that's not true. Hmm. Well, that's really interesting and it's kind of underappreciated. Yeah, no, because... <laughs> It's very clear that when you look at the revolution and people that seem to be at the front of the revolution, uh, especially when it was being televised, and it seemed to be just young people who were using social media and the Tahrir Square kind of movement, and they didn't really... They, they, they seem to be your common person, not the religious person. They seem no, to be no, your... Yeah. 
You know, they were the common guy and girl out there in their t-shirts and jeans and, you know, with their kind of uh, phone, mobile phone. And, and just th that's what, you know, the news, the media sure. had when it was mm -hmm. showing it. So it showed, it clearly demonstrated it was a people's kind of rising, that the, the people themselves were rising. It was not something, you know, on the back of a kind of let's have a theocracy or, a, you know, it wasn't something done not on the back all. of a an, yeah. uh, a faith no revolution. It was just people, yeah. we've had enough of corruption. And it comes back to that same thing, you know, just coming right yeah. back full circle. In essence, all people really want is a sense of justice they just want, <clears throat> you know, like, I have fundamental rights. I shouldn't have to bribe people to have my basic human rights. Like, I shouldn't, yeah. you know, I shouldn't have to, if I need to have something done or get a permit or do something, I shouldn't have to pay bribes. I shouldn't have to kind of like, uh, I, these are fundamental human rights. I should I should have access to them. And, and it's these things that people really, you know, when they say what god and islam and this is what they're seeing they're seeing truth just being honest living an honest you know have earning an honest wage not trying to harm people like it's basic human values i mean which today which are really you know whether it's which is what islam is saying it's not any different and and this is why I find it so surprising when sometimes Muslims will criticize like the, you know, the United Nations kind of charter for human rights. And they'll say things like, well, oh, my God, like, don't endorse things like that. That's made that's like made by man for human rights. But it's it's rights for human beings. It's not really saying anything that's fundamentally different to what Islam would be saying or any faith. Yeah, this, it's exactly that, I mean, it's exactly that turn that I feel is kind of new. I mean, at least it's different than the modernists in the, the turn of the 20th century. This idea that, like, there's this, I mean, I, I, I keep trying to think of a word other than cult, you know, but what is the word for, why does it have, what, like, so if there's a set of principles that are exact, first of all, we live in a diverse human community. If there's a set of principles that are, very similar to what you consider to be Sharia principles, then how could you not support that set of principles? Exactly. Why does it have to be part of your bubble? Like, what's up with the bubble? Yeah. I think that's the new thing, right? And and it's it's not serving us well. Yeah. And, and it's almost, yeah. it's seen with, <clears throat> like, when it comes to the United Nations, for example, or things like this, it's seen with contempt. Like, people feel that, no, this is a man-made, and for example, point such and such has made this particular, like they they may try and find a particular contentious point, but the, the overall thing, it will be that no, no, anything that humans have come up with, and, and this yeah. is such a naive uh, representation of Islam, because Islam is... It is, you know, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that, look, he is telling you in the Quran that he, this is here to enjoin good without explaining what good is, because you already as human beings have an understanding of what good is, you know, yeah. and this is here to prevent harm, you know, uh, these things, because you already know what they are. The Quran doesn't then go on to explain them. It just has an assumption that you, you know what what's good you know what's bad just you know just deal with it i mean yeah i think one thing we have to think about is that when i when i think about your question of like all right well why are people nitpicking the un declaration of human rights or why are they so suspicious one of the answers you often hear is all of the wars you know the the drones, hmm. the interference. You know Sykes Picot, the interference in so the, the distrust of the West, yeah. and you know that's sort of the um, that's the kind of immediate. I, 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 at this point, I want to say knee jerk yeah. uh, response. Yeah. I don't want to be insensitive, but like it's I don't know. I think what we're witnessing lately goes beyond a rational critique of. I, I could be wrong. 
it looks like it goes beyond a Western, uh, a, a rational critique of Western foreign policy and that it's really entered into like a, a whole other sphere. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I get, I do get that. I mean, I understand and I agree that naturally mm -hmm. politics will always play a role in, you know, in, in, in human interactions, especially at a global level, there will always be, you know, whether it's even intra-Muslim politics or whether it's going to be inter-politics or global politics. And, and naturally with, you know, you could, you could see, for example, and it's interesting because <coughs> you see America, because America is kind of, it's, it's very, America's like an, an odd case study, isn't it? It's like mm. something which, uh, like no country really seems to behave the way America seems to behave, no. and it seems to have this, you know. Uh, but but at the same time, it, it's kind of leading in in these things, and it's doing this, but then it's kind of throwing its weight around, and it's, um, and it's. So from a Muslim perspective, it's seen as the enemy of right. recent times. Um, Mm. So it's seen as, oh, this is the enemy, you know, they've come, look, they've invaded. And naturally, the, these things, obviously, the Iraq war and all these things, yeah. uh, I agree, are, are tragedies. But it's interesting that, you see, Muslim, the, the sentiment will then become confused with other countries because it's it's not so clear what's going on with those countries. So even though Russia, because of the Russia-Afghan war, had this kind of negative image yeah so fair enough but let's just say like so for example japan now japan doesn't muslims don't have a sentiment towards japan so it's no, like do it, it doesn't even mm. exist on the radar china it's surprising because china has good relationships with pakistan and it's in fact seen as one of the most friendliest nations to pakistan so uh so 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 they're kind of confused on this okay and then people have raised the whole weaker considering what's happening to the Uyghurs. Yes, yeah, so the Uyghur, right. Uyghur issue. And so it's yeah. interesting because you're going to have like Imran Khan, the who mm -hmm. raised, who built his whole kind of, his president, his, uh, you know, his presidency, I mean, the, the prime minister, sorry, his whole ministry on the back of, uh, we will establish a, a Medinan-like state. He said that in his, you know, in his inaugural speech that we will establish a state like that of Medina. And, that. and and he said, but and by that, I mean, justice and compassion and ethics and whatever. But when he went over to China and then he said that, look, this is just a, a national issue. It's like they're a political issue. The Uyghur thing is not an, a Muslim concern. It's not an Islamic global concern. So it's interesting, the whole... How, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> how politics yeah. does play that role yeah. i mean it's undeniable that um you know yes it is true because of the way america behaves around the world it's only natural that a lot of muslim countries will be incredibly suspicious and you know kind of just um just on the back foot whenever it comes to america thinking well you yeah. know i don't know um, yeah, but our whole existence cannot be resistance to America. Yeah. You know, that cannot be like, you know, not to get too into this rabbit hole, but the Syria conflict is really the one where it's like, guess what? America's <laughs> not at the center of that. I'm the, sorry. The Syrian conflict is like, I remember, I remember this yeah. clip that said, well, mm -hmm. if you think you're confused and then at the end of the four minutes, you're like mega confused. It says, yeah. well, Turkey, Iran, Russia, right. they're helping right. them, they're helping them, they're helping them. Not they're the only thing them. you can say is that it doesn't fit the mold of an American imperialist war, right? So it's, are we really getting anywhere by, I don't know, this like death to America? I mean, we're not kind of not there anymore, yeah. but we're in a very confusing time. Um, but we need to just kind of, I just feel like, Occam's razor, razor, you know, like the, the best way to solve the problem is to solve the problems you can solve in yourself, in your society. Just like start there. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I do feel coming back to what we were saying earlier on that, you know, with with the younger generation kind of um, taking more of the, the kind of the front seat because of just just sheer numbers. Because now the Muslim 
a majority within the Western world, uh, uh, arguably even in the Muslim, even Muslim. in the Muslim world, is now yeah. just it's going to be young people who are uh, they're definitely thirty and below. So yeah. that is now the majority of the Muslims, and the younger lot are increasing, you know, exponentially yeah. in number, outnumbering those who are older than them, and mm-hmm. thereby also diluting that kind of mindset and th- this is coming back to that point that i i sense that change is kind of there is some change on the horizon because people because yeah. the younger people ain't really they don't buy all this uh, or they're not that engaged by this no. whole talk of I, uh, I see the most interesting things on instagram and facebook from the youth like uh during ramadan right now you know normalize women being able to eat during their periods <laughs> you know uh nor little like oh you know hey like we didn't used to talk like you know or like you know i don't think they feel old like i don't know i mean they're just on this other plane and they're not you're like you other said they're just super woke culture <laughs> super woke muslims you know and you're like whoa i mean normal I, I think yeah. you see. I think that's bringing its own challenges and, yeah. and kind of oh, man. yeah. So we're, <laughs> we're going to soon move away from the challenges of old, and we're going to have this thing where everything has to be so politically correct and so yeah. We're in trouble. <laughs> I think we I think we are in serious trouble. Yeah. Both I definitely yeah. cannot fit in with that culture. So that's. <laughs> <laughs> I, they terrify me. I mean, I love them. I teach them, and I, I actually really like that generation. They're so thoughtful, but uh, they're also terrifying. So, mm, yeah. In yeah. terms of in terms of just getting mad, getting mad at you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> that is so. Uh, it's interesting yeah. because there is this whole. Um, there's a, there's a. It's like the you know amongst a, a younger generation there is a. An energy to fight, but the, but they're not quite sure what the fight is. <laughs> but there's a, <laughs> but there's a strong spirit <laughs> that is spirit. to to fight. Yeah. Like we want to fight for something, but we're not quite sure what that thing is. But we need yeah. to fight for it. <laughs> it's like it changes every day. It's like it, it's like it changes every day. There's a new thing to you know. Oh man, Russell. Ah, yeah. oh, that's uh. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, but do you find that this generation still have that interest? You said, look, I teach them. Uh, do you mm-hmm. find that there is this interest still there in when it comes to learning and when it comes to wanting to, you know, acquire knowledge about, about the, about the tradition or, the, or what, it, or, you know, just the whole history and everything, like the tradition. Theology. Yeah, of course. Do you find yeah, that yes. there is? I do. I absolutely do. Yeah, no, they're, you know, they, they're curious. They, I mean, the thing is the, the major mysterious life questions never get solved, you know? Uh, So they're always going to be there and they are absolutely, you know, this is kind of why I love teaching what I teach because I teach like the weird mysterious stuff that, you know, you can keep talking about forever. We're not going to exhaust it, you know. So, so what's I, what's I, what's some weird myster- mis- mysterious stuff? Well, you know, why are we here? Oh, uh, what happens the ultimate when we questions. Die? All right. Yeah, the ultimate question stuff. You know, um, what is the nature of truth? Allahu Akbar. Yeah, this is it. we need we need yeah. we need some DMT to get on this scale. <laughs> <laughs> Oh uh, yes, yeah, that would be very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! So, no, that's I definitely because I a, a lot of the interactions I have with uh, through social media with people that are young that are asking a lot of these questions. I do, I do. On one hand, I find I see that that side that they. That, that they can't relate to the things of old and therefore this is why maybe some of them c- come to people like me or they uh, mm. their interest because they do have that genuine interest they want to learn um and now <laughs> and they're very vocal they're not you know it's like you said they 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 say it they don't really care and they sure do yeah, yeah. so which is yeah. which is quite 
you know, because <laughs> the questions <laughs> now will be like, well, why? Why is it like this? No. And, you know, even you think, whoa, 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 OK, <laughs> yeah, need to ease up. But um, but at, on this, you know, on the same token, there is with this, I feel the whole the nature of the discourse is changing as well now. You see, it's coming on to things like they want to the 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 discussions to do with Islam have kind of evolved as well now with them, as in it's more about their kind of struggles in light of Islam, I guess. So it's you know, it's these whether it's going to be these rights movements or these, you know, whatever they they kind of struggle yeah. that they are involved with, but they want to know about that in light of islam and so it's like, it's interesting what does islam say about transgender issues yeah what does islam exactly so this about, is a yeah. huge topic now so people everybody yeah. would want to know about it. whereas if you went back you know 10 years even no. nobody would really you know this would seldom ever be asked things like this and and i feel that wow so on but but the connection to the faith i still see it because it's like you're saying these things are you know, constant journeys for everyone, that, that kind of soul searching, that that kind of, well, you know, why are we here? And yeah. where it's are an we amazing going? Thing. I mean, no matter what happens in in a lifespan or in a generation or in a century, all human beings are always going to to have those same questions. <laughs> you know? yeah. It's crazy. Does it I, does anybody ever arrive at the answer? <laughs> Uh, yeah uh, it's true though i mean it, yeah uh yeah yeah i mean you have a different role than i do you you they people you're a mufti so people uh people ask you to answer these questions for them i go out of my way to say that i am not uh you know um I'm not a spiritual leader. I'm a professor, so I teach you know i'm I'm like, but you know of course you design your your curriculum in such a way. My goal is to show people the the absolute um, complexity and intellectual depth of Islam and different approaches. That you is know, amazing. That's my goal. That that you know. that is amazing because that is the yeah. the legacy of Islam that I absolutely you know I'm in love with as well. That the depth, the profundity of the intellectual, uh, the thought, and just richness of that tradition that that is there i mean amongst other things but that is the the thing that i've you know that has captivated me and i hope to you know maybe kindle the flame for other people so i think you are yeah mm-hmm Chukran. I mean, I, I don't envy you having to actually answer questions like what does Islam say about <laughs> transgenderism like that? I mean, you know, you can do it, you know, but it's just like that's those are. Yeah, it's Typical. not an easy job. It's not hot. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you've got to fight. Uh, what is it? Because uh, every time you engage in these kind of discussions, you're thrown off orthodox people. There'll be somebody trying to catapult you outside of orthodox Islam. Well, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can you go oh. and line up with the non-Muslims, please? <laughs> and, well, I mean, this happened to me a lot after the blasphemy debate. Yeah, um, right. And, oh. and uh, I just... So I'm not in that world. Like I don't watch those YouTube videos and I don't, I'm not so much on Twitter. And so I was just shocked. And for me, I'm like, wait, I'm sorry. Who are you yeah. to catapult me out of Islam? Like exact, like, why do you feel that you have that authority? It's amazing. Yeah. It, it, the, when did this arrogance happen? I just, that's a little, <laughs> you know, that's a little bit new. Like, and based on what, because you don't, you Based on what? Because I dis you disagree with me, or because I don't wear hijab, and like now you're gonna get on and fire and brimstone me on. <laughs> oh and and I oh felt that that's uh, that that's actually, yeah. and the discussion in and of itself was very fascinating, very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. For people who haven't seen it, I'll um, it's it's on YouTube, um, and it's something I think definitely that if if you if you watch it, it shows because. Even in the discussion, I did feel and that uh, Sheikh Yasser Qadi did bring up. Uh, you see, it's it's not it's not about Sheikh Yasser Qadi, but it's just about this whole role that so often is seen that when a discussion is there to to kind of bring power elements into it, like well, you know, 
orthodoxy, uh, Sunni Islam. Obviously, it's all Sunni Islam. I mean, uh, you you weren't there arguing from a Shia perspective or from a, you know, you, you were just, or other people, you know, Muqtada Khan wasn't yeah, there arguing from, from a, it was all Sunni Islam anyway. But it's just to, you see, when people take, they assume certain agency or power dynamics within a discourse to say, well, you see, you have to, you know, just let me just remind my remind everybody of my authority. It it becomes quite. I just feel that that is, um, you see, that's what then it's all also encouraging for other people to kind of just lash out. Um, it's it's basically I f I feel that w we need to kind of outgrow this way of speaking we need to allow people to encourage mm. discussion encourage yeah. a discourse Absolutely. and and leadership needs to take leadership you know if if i'm an imam if i'm a sheikh if i'm you know an islamic preacher then i should be teaching my following not be, being dictated to as in i'm to you know oh my god i can't you know i can't kind of like rock the boat because no, I should be kind of like, well, steer ahead. This is how we how we're gonna do this. But yeah, right. I mean, well, I'm, I just I feel grateful that I just don't ever I don't have the gene in. I don't recognize their boat. Like I'm not intimidated by this. Oh, you have to be like me. No, I don't. Who are you? I don't know. No, I don't have it. Um, I, because maybe I know my history. I guess you know. But it's just this is a very um, I don't know. It's a, a kind of authoritarian way of acting. And I don't know why, how anyone can claim to speak in the voice of the ultimate truth or of God with such authority and such fire and brimstone. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't conform to my understanding of Islam. And I don't know. And, and, the, and the, I feel the hubris that is assumed yeah, when you? people mm -hmm. claim to speak in the voice of God. I find yeah, that just so arrogant. Yeah, like I, feel, I find that you know people criticize me. People criticize me for answering mm -hmm. a lot of my questions when I answer them by saying that look, in my opinion, in my understanding, in my, and and that's actually one of the common criticisms against me by my haters is that. Oh, wow. I mean, yeah. And th Come they on. say that you know, well, we didn't ask for your opinion. We didn't ask for your understanding. We're saying, what does Allah say? And you think, well, look how dumb this is, because obviously mm -hmm. whoever's telling you what Allah is saying is just telling you his interpretation of what yeah. Allah is saying. It's not like Allah is actually speaking through him. Yes. So, uh, yeah, we don't do that in Islam. We don't have a class of people <laughs> who speak directly to God. And no. Yeah, I mean, I uh, people should know that, yeah. you know. Well, maybe we don't. Maybe thinking is kind of scary sometimes, you know. Mm. Um, so you have to grow into it. Yeah, and and I and I do feel that this thing of this, um, it is so. Uh, th th this journey, we have to understand mm -hmm. that it is our journey to God. Like we are human beings, it is our road, our path. It is not God coming to us in that sense. That we are trying to discover along the way. We are trying to kind of like. You know, we have to walk this path. We have to realize we and there'll be ups and downs. And and this is another thing with religion. Often people are held in check that, oh, my God, that you has your, you know, that uh, as though your faith has sunk all of a sudden that, oh, my God, you haven't done this. This sense of accountability, this sense of, mm -hmm. oh, my God, mm -hmm. you must always, you know, Iman, now that you have it, it must be this this kind of like high horse that is always kind of you are just static and it can never and people hold each other in check you know they, they kind of that's like, really sad because when i i you know people cannot we're human so we can't maintain that yeah. so it ends up with a lot of hypocrisy and double lives and 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 lying uh i've seen that over and over again so that's not really the point you know yeah no absolutely absolutely and mm -hmm. It's yeah, but I mean, I suppose it is a one on the bright side. There is mm -hmm. this uh, coming back to, I suppose, what we were saying about a double-edged kind of blade, which is 
modern day information technology and the, its proliferation and you mm-hmm. can't really stop the voice of people and although it does no. bring weird people but <laughs> i suppose it depends us a perspective who's weird <laughs> we're pro- we're probably the weird ones <laughs> well weird is not necessarily bad i think we're talking about something another word yes, yeah yeah but, so it does yeah, bring yeah, out it, yeah we're definitely weird <laughs> it brings yeah. out the nutcases but yes, it also go. allows mm. the 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 voice of enlightenment to just speak and you know people who want to uh mm. gravitate towards it can do so whereas in the past like if you like let's just say even if it was a few decades ago like <clears throat> yourself dr sar you know you trying to uh, express yourself get your message out there i know you you said i focus more on just teaching and i'm not trying to go about kind of be an an imam or something like that but still as your message just putting it out there Yeah. Uh, and even me like me trying to just put my message out there the truth is how would have it been done because you would have been just denied access to you know because the gatekeepers of certain platforms would just deny access because they would be like well no you know this doesn't conform this is too you know liberal or modern or or yeah. unorthodox or deviant or and you wouldn't be able to speak because that's right you know maybe you'll write a book but they'll just burn the book <laughs> <You know? laughs> so and exile you and forcibly divorce you with all that all those tricks yeah no you're right it's true pretty much anyone can say i i do notice that a lot of the people that i would want to hear more from um don't have as many channels on youtube i think we need more of that yeah. you know it's um, yeah it's it's interesting because mm-hmm. i've I've said this um in the past as well that especially in Arabic I've said that it's shocking that when you consider the number of Arabic speaking countries in the world and you look at the amount of you know the like Egypt Al Azhar such an ancient institution uh mm-hmm. you've got the I know it's not as functional but Zaytuna in Tunis in Tunis and the Qarawiyin in Morocco another institute so many mm. universities so many reasonably you know you'll get enlightened voices absolutely yeah but still when you run a google search for an yeah. issue in arabic like 9 out of 10 things forums that come up are just salafi so i love that you made that point on one of your recent shows because that is so true and it's, you know and and you said that it, it it's uh it's so you know, disproportionate that- proportionate it is absolutely i say that to my students all the time it's so I mean, disproportionate because what you what think it's a slam is salafism uh and it's disproportionate and that so i spent all my time trying to correct that basically yeah because that's very that's a big problem because and and that's yeah. such a it's just wow and I, i and i don't understand how that is is like that because you have enough faculties with and talent to be able to mm. just write stuff in arabic and have it out there on online but it just does it's not they're very well resourced and organized and you know they have states backing them mm. you know so it's like an uphill battle but i i think even just saying even bringing it to people's attention hey guess what you're hearing it a particular version of islam here and in fact it's a reform movement and it's very recent and so you need at least to know that you need to move beyond this yeah wow absolutely yeah. absolutely so yeah well i mean i think that's <laughs> that's something to <laughs> to at least hope for inshallah that there is some oh. hope from the uh enlightened voices inshallah you know on a, on a, a quick note and i know we've been uh taking up quite a <laughs> quite a lot of time as well and I'll have to catch a bit of sahur <laughs> before oh, uh, oh, <laughs> so this yeah. but I I know we spoke previously about the whole blasphemy thing and and in Egypt there was uh, the whole thing with um, uh uh with Dr. Uh, Taha and the whole uh, you know with blasphemy when he'd questioned the Arabic language I'm I'm not so sure if you were um I mean the the whole thing about uh, when he'd questioned the Sha'r al-Jahili 
and said that mm, a lot of mm, this mm, had been mm, fabricated mm, mm. in his book uh, 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 I think it was called I think it was actually just called Fisher Adil Jahili. And he says a lot mm. of this was fabricated in the Abbasid era and stuff like this. And, yeah. and he'd been uh, put on trial for blasphemy. <laughs> yeah. In a state like Egypt, which you don't think is actually that harsh yeah. on such matters of. Uh, you know, but it's just uh, it's just something that occurred to me. I did. Uh, I thought, well, it's just worth it. It's just amazing that, wow, you know, you can how tenuous things can be that you could be questioning something. And and it's, you know, people could just whack on a label that, oh, my God, this is, yeah. you know, you're. This reminds me of uh, Shahab Ahmed's work, his book on orthodoxy. Oh, right. where what talks- is Islam? That, that one? Not the what is Islam, actually the other one um, about the satanic verses and orthodoxy. I actually can't remember the name of that book right now. The Formation of Orthodoxy. I can't remember what it's called. Sata- the, his other book that came out um, about the satanic verses and orthodoxy. But what he does is he shows how the satanic verses was uh, a non-controversial event that was discussed in the earliest sources. And even up until the 19th century in Egypt, it could be discussed openly. And then at one point in the mid 20th century, it became kufr and people were put on trial. So one of his central questions is to ask what happened yeah. historically, you know, to make this, th- how could something that's a, that's go from? That's a very interesting point. Wow. Illicit. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, oh, you know, it's, I haven't actually yeah. read that book of his. Okay, I'll actually yeah. check that out. Yeah, wow, that's a, that's a very incredible, incredibly powerful point. That how could it be that something which uh, is actually spoken by Muslims, and yep. even though some Muslims did reject this, it's interesting actually that people like Qadi Yad, who said that who you know decried it and said that this is. Uh, insulting to the Prophet, uh, yet people like Ibn Taymiyyah, who's hailed today as a, a superhero of is- Islamic thought, that he he said that th- that it actually happened. He said that this satanic verses it was a authentic, and the devil basically got the Prophet to s- add verses to the Quran, make them up to praise false gods. And, yeah. and he said, but it's it's no big deal because Allah corrected it. Yeah. And well, Ibn Taymiyyah would be on trial for <laughs> blasphemy today. In Kato, so. I mean, can you just, yeah. can we just, yeah. <laughs> if you just take a moment yeah. to just let that sink, yeah. you think, right. oh my God, like what on earth is he saying? He's saying that yeah. shaitan kind of influenced the prophet to kind of add verses to the Quran and that two verses which glorify the pagan gods and completely nullify Tawheed. But it's okay. Don't worry. It did happen. This is Ibn Taymiyyah. It did happen. But khair, Allah corrected it. And Allah says, you know, it's, it's no big deal. Yeah, that was the main position until recently. <laughs> That's just crazy, isn't it? I mean, we just think about that. Yeah. And you think, wow. And and, and in considering the fact that not only was that discussed and written and kind of somehow, uh, to some extent, I won't say normalized, but to some extent it was kind of like tolerated and... It, it's normal. Yeah, as in it was part of the discussion. And, and even yeah. then, Ibn Taymiyyah himself is especially in recent times glorified massively like it's not it's not a problem you know he said it so what that's an academic position of his you know it's an ilmi position and you think yeah this is wow and people cut him a lot of slack that they don't cut the rest of us yeah Mm -hmm. wow that that is uh so (laughs) so true but uh, Dr. Sarah, it's been epic. Uh, I've really thoroughly uh, enjoyed the discussion. I mean, a lot of interesting things from the Sharia, what it means to why people want it, to hudud, to iconography of the Sharia, why it's pictured in certain ways, is the recent political kind of upheaval, how that ties in with people wanting Islam, the Muslim Brotherhood, all of these things, right down to blasphemy and Ibn Taymiyyah and the satanic verses. A lot for people to, <laughs> to, to kind of digest. Oh, we got into hijab and we got into women. So I think yeah. we've covered... Wow, well, do... quite quite a bit there, alhamdulillah. Yeah. So, yeah. alhamdulillah. so uh, people... Uh, 
Sarah, would you, is there something if you'd like to say to the viewers before we wrap it up, maybe a, if there's any message and also how can they connect with you if they want to as well? Uh, where should oh, they reach okay. out? Yeah. Well, um, Ramadan Kareem is what I want to say to people. Oh, and bruh. thank you for listening. <laughs> and and uh, if you want to get in contact with me, I have a website, um, sarahelsantawi.com. And you can, the contact form just goes to my email. Or you can look me up at Fordham and send me an email there. Although if you're going to uh, declare me some like a Kaffir, don't send it to my work account. <laughs> you can just use my website for that. So... That's it. Oh, yeah. Allah. There you go, guys. You got that. <laughs> thank yeah. you very much, Mufti. I'm a big fan of yours, and I really appreciate it. This is super fun. Oh. And thank you for the work you are doing. Oh, shukran, shukran. I dearly appreciate that. It, it means much, alhamdulillah. So shukran once again. So people, you've heard that. You know where to connect. Uh, reach out to the website or the email. I will, uh, I'll put a link to your website in the, in the YouTube description. Okay, so okay, yeah, great. cool. Very easy, just my name dot com. Right, you're doing it. And any any books on the way? Inshallah, I may have my book called Sharia on trial on the Nigeria issues and the stoning that we talked about today. And I'm working on a book now on the on the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. So that'll Ra I can't say rattling. That. You're rattling but, cages. You're rattling cages. Uh, yeah, and I don't know why, but it's the way I was born, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> right. So once again, and people, shukran for watching, for taking the time. Uh, uh, if you've got any questions, leave them in the comments. Otherwise, remember to like and subscribe. I'll put up the exit page as we do leave. And once again, from me, Salam Allahi Alaikum wa Rahmatu Taala. And Dr. Sarah, once again, shukran. Well, uh, I well, really appreciate um, Jazakallah Khair for taking the time out. Thank you so much. Ramadan Karim. <laughs>